Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Bitcoin, for some, it's the perfect marriage of technology and finance. For others, it's a get-rich scheme. Though no one can deny its market value is soaring and becoming an attractive alternative to the current global banking system. Is Bitcoin revolutionizing the world? Cross-talking Bitcoin, I'm joined by my guest, Mitch Feierstein in New York. He is a fund manager and author of the book, Planet Ponzi. In Atlantic, we have Jeffrey Tucker. He is director of content for the Foundation for Economic Education. And in Cambridge, we cross to Garrick Heilman. He is a research fellow at the University of Cambridge. All right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Gary, let me go to you first in Cambridge. Explain what is going on with Bitcoin. I mean... I'm of the age, and I used to work in finance, I, I can remember the dot-com uh, bubble and then its meltdown here. Uh, not being very well uh, uh, versed in Bitcoin, what is going on here? Is this just speculation or is this the new uh, shiny, radiant future? Go ahead in Cambridge. Right. Well, I think uh, I think a little bit of both, to be honest. Uh, and certainly, we've seen you know some aspects of the story before, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, after the dot-com bubble exploded in 2000, 2001, um, there were a number of winners that emerged from that era, and a number of new companies that were born after that have done quite well. Um, you know, Bitcoin has already been declared dead several times. In 2011, mm -hmm. Wired wrote a, an article saying the rise and fall of Bitcoin. We saw the crash in 2014, yet it keeps coming back. So it wouldn't surprise me if we have another crash, maybe a few more in front of us. But it does seem that there's something important happening here with regards to the future of finance, the future of money. Yeah, well, at least for a, a, a small number of people, they become at least, I guess, technically in the cloud somewhere fabulously rich. It's really an amazing story. Jeffrey, I mean, um, Gary called this, I think, in an article, uh, a minor miracle. Uh, is that, it, it, would you use the word miracle here? Let me go to Jeffrey in Atlantic. Yeah, I read that article, and I, I appreciate that term, actually. It kind of is. Nobody ever thought anything like this was possible before 2008, before the white paper of, two, of October 2008. We didn't really have the means to do what the blockchain does today. Uh, just for background, the blockchain is the real underlying technology of, of Bitcoin and the real reason for its value. Uh, Bitcoin is just an expression of that technological value. I, and uh, blockchain allows us to do something we've always wanted to do since the ancient world, but never had the ability to do it. But thanks to these distributed networks and cryptography, we can do it now. You know, you know Mitch, I guess, I guess Jeffrey kind of put it in uh, uh, succinctly for me because, you know, I was in finance for a number of years and, and there's always, you know, what's it backed up by? You know, you know what, what, what are the assets? You know, you know, you always look at that. And then, but what Jeffrey just said there kind of explains it. It's the technology. Technology is the safety. That's what's it backing it up here. Do you buy that? Because, you know, you can say this is a, a scheme, it's a get rich, but I mean, it, it, there's something to it. And, and people are, are making money here. And, I, and it makes everyone interested to get involved in it if you have the means. Go, go ahead, Mitch. How do you explain it all? Well, I mean, we need perspective, I think. Uh, Bitcoin has come about in a time where the central banks, reckless central bank policy yeah. around the yeah. world has distorted every market and too much credit, too much debt, and too much leverage have created instability in the financial markets. So we need to add perspective. So we need to look at risk versus reward with Bitcoin <clears throat> and the Bitcoin trade. So Bitcoin has gigantic volatility. You're seeing 30% moves either way in a day or 40% yeah. moves. For, so it's not for the faint of heart. So you know my perspective from an investor and being in the banking community internationally for 38 years, you look at the iconic figures like Jamie Dimon, who said it's a Ponzi scheme and it's going to zero. Right. He's yeah. totally wrong, but the establishment banks and the way that the fractional banking system works, people want to escape from that. People want to escape from the establishment. But what we've got going on here, just to be clear, is we've got inflation in every asset class. Stocks are trading at stratospheric valuations. Apple has a market cap approaching, eclipsing $1 trillion. Facebook at 600 billion. So if you look yesterday, uh, or a couple, sorry, if you look um, recently, you saw a pullback in the NASDAQ, the FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, and all the technology issues. They lost $60 billion in market cap in a day, where the market cap of Bitcoin right. is what, around $160 right. billion. So on a relative 
basis, it's a much smaller move, and it's a very emerging market. So I think we've got to look at where we are. And it's an alternative asset class. I mean, you're looking at art. A Leonardo da Vinci painting traded at right. $450 million. Right. So, I mean, we need to put it into the proper historical perspective. Now, stocks are way overvalued, so are bonds, and so is property. So people are looking to get out of the dollar system, and I happen to agree you need to di diversify, but I think you should also get some precious metals, gold and silver, which have been currencies for 6,000 okay. years. Uh, let me, the dollar let, is backed by fundamentally nothing. Nothing. Okay, let me go back to Cambridge. I mean, there's a lot of people are saying that um, uh, uh, large investors are getting involved, interested in Bitcoin. Is that distorting the price? Because they have the deep pockets that they this price level to get into the market. Is there something uh, uh, behind that there? The, you know, the, the, it, because I, having been in, in, in finance, I mean, the, this, is, this is speculation, okay? I mean, the people are not buying on facts, they're buying on speculation right now. Go ahead, Garrett, in, in, uh, in Cambridge. Right. I, I think certainly the hedge funds, the, the big whales that are coming in, the, billion, the billionaires we read about, uh, you know, are, are certainly influencing the price direction. Um, but I think there's still a lot of money on the sidelines. I was at a hedge fund conference recently and less than 20 percent of, uh, of, of the funds in the room, and there were some pretty big funds in the room, have, have taken a step into the space. And I think the ones that have, a lot of them have done so as individuals rather than putting their funds in because you know, it's still very difficult to short Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, there's major counterparty risk. Uh, a lot of the exchanges, cryptocurrency exchanges, won't do things like uh, reveal their, their financials, their audited financials to, to funds. So uh, things that, you know, hedge funds are used to having uh, in, a, in typical markets they trade in are, are not in place yet here, but they're coming. Uh, if CME, NASDAQ, uh, do come into the market with futures uh, platforms, you know, if things like ETFs and, you know, other things roll out, bring more regulation, yeah. Uh, to the space, then I think you will see even more hedge funds come in, and the price, you know, could go either way. Frankly, I think the the, the investment playing field has been a bit lopsided yep. uh, in favor of the bulls, and uh, that could level. And a lot of the yeah, the hedge fund guys aren't good. passionate about crypto, um, and frankly, they would uh, probably, I think, from a psychological perspective, prefer to make money if Bitcoin crashes on the way down than no, going up. That would certainly yeah. help them rationalize their lateness to the Martinic you know, market. You know, Jeffrey, it's very interesting is that it, it, it's it, I think one of the interesting phenomena about Bitcoin is it, its lack of regulation and going back what Mitch had to say here. And we have to remember uh, this phenomenon came into being after the financial cri uh, crisis of 2008, the, which the banks were That's responsible right. for. And so it, it, it's is, is, is this an element of that here? Uh, because that, that the freedom of here. The, but the, 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 the go ahead, jump in. Go ahead. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, no, there certainly is. The, 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 I think of the success of Bitcoin uh, is in part attributable to the fact that it has not been managed from the center. It's not been regulated, and that allows a lot of innovation and for people to try out things. You know, you want to talk about market caps. You can talk about $150 billion for, for Bitcoin, but really you have to look at the whole class of crypto assets right now. And you're looking at, uh, last I checked, it was about $350 billion once you include all the various tokenized blockchains that are out there, all the various Ethereum applications, the various altcoins, uh, and, and we're just beginning to see these. We're gonna see things coming up uh, within the next year, like these lightning networks that are going to be used for small transactions uh, that are going to fix the prevailing problems that exist in Bitcoin, which is that the networks are vastly clogged right now. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive to send and receive. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, it's, it's growing so hard, so fast, that it's almost become unusable just by itself for well, regular uh, small transactions. That, so, that's, that's the so reason. So investors are, that, that's, are looking for things like headphones. Yeah, funds. that's the reason why I never really got into it, because it's just not easy to move around. At least I'm not adept at doing those kind of things here. You know, Mitch, another, a lot of people are saying that yeah. this whole thing with uh, Bitcoin, it's really just an investment. It's not really a, 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 a mechanism to buy and sell. It is to park your money somewhere and, and leave it there because you don't trust the banks. I mean. It, it, for it to be really um, universal, you have to be able to have, be able to use your wallet, as they call it, you know, and, you know, and buy things and sell things. It's not that easy to do. It's not widely accepted, although many uh, more innovative people do say they accept it. Go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, it's part of a you know, it's part of a diversification strategy where you'd have some Bitcoin and just sit on it and not worry about what your basis was and whatever the losses are, you're going to eat the losses, and if you get a profit out of it, fine. But, you know, it, when you have that much volatility, 
you know, I disagree that the big hedge funds will get involved in this when you have a 30% vol you know, volatility swing each direction. So from peak to trough and back up again, down and up again, I mean, no investor wants to tolerate that kind of volatility. And how can you manage that kind of volatility it becomes very difficult. So are the hedge funds and the banks going to jump in head first up at these levels? Probably not. If we get a, more bit, of, a bit more stability into these markets, you'll see more investment. But also, from that risk-reward perspective, you've also got to keep in mind that this is a non-regulated market. That's the attractiveness from people. Right. But governments have overreached, like we're seeing in the media right now. The deep state runs America. They're trying to rewrite history here with these statue wars. And that's always a dangerous time. So if too many people get on the Bitcoin train and get on the crypto train, the government could come in one day and say it's illegal in this country. We're cracking down on everybody. Because right now, when you open up an account, they, they demand the KYC, know your customer information. And they, they will, when it becomes bigger, they will try to regulate it and they will try to control it. It's difficult for the government to let anything come out of its, you know, come out of its grasp. The Federal Reserve prints willy-nilly trillions and trillions of dollars since we went off the gold standard backed by nothing. Now, that's, this is a Ponzi scheme. The government, yeah. that's what my book is about, the government debt globally is a Ponzi scheme. The governments can never repay this debt and we're about to hit a wall. So should people invest in alternative asset classes? Absolutely. Is a Leonardo da Vinci painting, painting worth half a billion dollars? Is an apartment in Midtown, Midtown Manhattan worth $600 million? I would argue no, it's not. I would agree. Tuition prices from when I went to university have gone up 2,000%. Yep. Where real wages since the 1980s are flat. Right. So how does that work out? When I got out of school, I could have bought a right. two-bedroom apartment Mitch, on let me, Park Avenue let me for jump in here. That's Gentlemen, seven, I have to go to a break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Bitcoin. Stay with RT. buddy Max, famous financial guru, and well, he's a little bit different. I'm honest Abe. You're Abraham Lincoln. Oh my God, they're, they're rolling their windows up. With all the drama happening in our great country, I'm hitting the road to have some fun and meet everyday Americans. I don't know where you're going to <laughs> hopefully start to bridge the gap. This is the Great American Pilgrimage. Great American Pilgrimage. <laughs> Most people think to stand out in this business, you need to be the first one on top of the story or the person with the loudest voice or the biggest ratings. In truth, to stand out in the news business, you just need to ask the right questions and demand the right answers. Question more. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Really? The only show I go out of my way to watch him. It really packs a punch. Ow! Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. They do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email.
They called me a useful idiot. I'm a useful idiot. You called me a useful idiot. A useful idiot. An useful idiot. By expressing my opinions on RT. There are thousands of us doing it. Behind this report is a simple strategy. We attack persons instead of talking about the arguments. What's next? Why stop there? You'll ban me from getting this close to the White House? I'm with the group code pink. Why not ban the color pink? Why not stretch me on the rack? I should be sent to the Tower of London because I'm a traitor. Break me on the wheel. I have to put up with a lifetime of this sort of nonsense. You don't scare me. You won't scare us. And I'll continue to voice my opinion. I'll continue to speak out. I'm in good company. But I'm in good company. You can explain your ideas. Because we are free thinkers. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing Bitcoin. Garrett, let me go back to you in, in Cambridge. While it is a fascinating concept, these cryptocurrencies, there is the concern um, of accountability. You know, illegal drugs, arms, and other kinds of illegal activity can st stay under the radar of the authorities. I mean, I think that's a kind of a downside. Also, you know, when people talk about it as being a, uh, a, a new fiat currency one day, I mean, you know, people are buying uh, uh, big ticket items because they are avoiding taxation and things like that. Um, so, I mean, it, it kind of cuts both ways here. I guess really the most important question will be if, if this kind of, of cryptocurrencies are successful, what is the temptation of governments to step in to regulate it and would regulation kill it? Go ahead. Right. You know, it's been very interesting to watch the, the migration of regulatory interests across this space. I mean, first we had law enforcement with the, the rise of the Silk Road and the online dark web, it's the use of Bitcoin, uh, take an interest in the sector. More recently, securities regulators. And, and with the up uh, swing in, in prices, I'm sure tax authorities are kind of next in line to, to start getting involved. Um, with regards to the law enforcement question, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword for law enforcement because on the one hand, uh, you know, you know these, these currencies do enable privacy on, on dark web transactions. But on the other hand, law enforcement, when they catch a criminal who's been using Bitcoin and they get a hold of their wallet software, uh, they get effectively their books uh, and they may have a good chance of recovering some of the funds. And that's not something you get with a cash criminal where there isn't record keeping. So you can use the blockchain to prosecute uh, cases, and that has been done. And law enforcement, I think, at least in some jurisdictions, is steadily becoming more um, open to seeing crime committed with, uh, with blockchain technology. It does give them an advantage over cash crime. Okay, it's a very transparent technology. That's an amazing plus for it. Uh, Jeffrey, uh, earlier this week, there was a San Francisco judge putting pressure on a company that trades in these uh, commodities and these currencies here. Uh, they want to see their books. They want to see names. They want to see transactions here. What kind of threat is that to Bitcoin? Or can Bitcoin evolve with this kind of supervision and regulation from the outside? Because my sense is, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the people that started this whole thing don't like the state, they don't like authority, they, they really want to be on their own here. We're going to see an encroachment on, this, uh, on these kinds of, uh, uh, of currencies and, and you know, f alternative financial well, mechanisms. Go ahead. You know, the, the regulation of the exchanges began in the spring of 2013. So far as I'm concerned, it was a disaster. Uh, we would have been much further along without these uh, regulations. This is the main way that government can control Bitcoin. It's not actually controlling Bitcoin. What they're doing is controlling the traffic between national monies and, and crypto assets coming and going. They can control that. And the U.S. has some of the worst regulations in the world uh, on, on crypto assets right now, on these exchanges. Well, I mean, but, why is that? You know, Je Jeffrey, why are, is these that? These markets are global. Well, why is that? Why, why is that situation exist in the U.S.? Well, because the regulators are trying to force a, a, a modern a digital technology into an analog, old world style regulatory framework, and it's not working. And all it's doing is driving the innovation out of this country and to other places. You know, you can buy Bitcoin much easier in a, in, in a place like Israel than you can in the United States or in Brazil. 
you know, I've, I've, I've been to exchanges all over the world. Most of them are very free and easy, and there's a lot of entrepreneurship there. In the U.S., it's all about command and control. It's a huge mistake for American regulators to be taking this direction, because they're just going to drive the innovation and the capital outside the borders. Bitcoin I mean, and crypto assets in general are global technologies. Yeah, they don't care about the nation state. Okay, Mitch, you know, address that issue there because, I mean, the almighty dollar, it's a threat. To, you know, Bitcoin and all these other things are a threat to, to, the, to the, uh, the global domination of the dollar. It's, it's obviously something the U.S. Well, yeah, doesn't want to have happen. Right. I mean, you're, we're, right, we're talking about U.S. dollar hegemony. And, you know, my view is US, the days of U.S. dollar hegemony are, are very limited. Look. Before the United States became the reserve currency, I think in 1913, when they created the Federal Reserve, which is a disaster that should be shuttered, um, we, the British sterling was the reserve currency of the world for 300 years. Now, was the United States responsible with the petrodollar and going off the gold standard in the Nixon era? I would argue no. I would argue that this has caused market distortion. I would argue that the central bank policies in the last 10 years have been more destructive than the good that they've provided, because I don't see that we've created growth for the trillions of dollars in debt that we've created. Now, the, uh, as we saw in the last administration in Washington, big government is in right now. So our, our, our government is gargantuan, and they want overreach with everything in every part of people's lives in America. And to do that, if you get an iron fist on the banking system and make people take away cash, like one of the professors at Harvard wrote a book to get rid of all cash, make people put their money into the bank. This is, this is a very dangerous thing. That's why people are migrating to other platforms. So we're at a point in time in history that could be very pivotal, pivotal as to how we move forward with this. But the, you know, the media is controlled. And if you look at regulation, they don't regulate companies like Amazon that dips their fingers into everything and every different business, or Facebook, or Google that have become oligarchy, uh, oligarchies, right. and basically these are they're controlling the content that everybody sees, and this is where the regulatory agency should be looking, not to control people's currency movements or whether they want to buy gold or invest a bit in Bitcoin. They should look at controlling the Facebooks, the Googles, and looking at, at news, the news entities, because news in this country has become opinion and political advocacy, yeah. and this is a way for the liberal left to rewrite history, which is extremely dangerous. If we look, Mark Thompson, who ran BBC during the Jimmy Seville pedophile scandal, snuck out of London and came to run the New York Times. And people f have forget about history and where people are and how they move around, but the same establishment figures are running things. Well, 160 companies used to control the media, now it's down to six. Yeah, Gary, one of the things back in Cambridge, one of the things I find appealing about Bitcoin uh, and I'm, I, I can't say that I'm an expert on it by a long shot. It seems to promote entrepreneurship, which I think is a really good thing. Um, again, you know, people that want to get out of the system, away from the system, away from re regulation. Is it fair to say that this, these cryptocurrencies would uh, be good for innovation? I, I think absolutely. Uh, I don't think anyone doubts that. And I think actually, you know, is, is, uh, you know I think people can argue about how bad the regulation is. But, but in certain markets, there's been a very pro-cryptocurrency uh, attitude because of the innovative aspects of it. And, it, and people are taking a much lighter touch uh, in Switzerland, and in the UK even, and, and, and elsewhere because of the amount of investment that's coming in, um, because of the you know, faster, cheaper, better ways we can do things with this technology. And not just the technology itself, but also the new funding channels that are opening up. I mean, the ICO phenomenon, uh, which we haven't really talked about, is... is on the one hand, scary because there are some projects out there that you know clearly are fraudulent. But at, at the same time, you're also opening up access to early stage technology, to seed stage technology, to anyone around the world with an internet connection. This used to be something you had to be a rich VC right. to be able to do. Now, if you have a computer, have a little cryptocurrency, you can invest in early stage technology. That has a lot of risks, and it also has a lot of opportunities. It's personally, for me, I think an exciting part of the story. You know, Mitch. You know, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Oh. Okay, Jeffrey, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, no, I just, I'm glad you brought up this point about the ICO because they've been kind of smeared in the financial press as being, uh, you know, just, just scams. And it's true, there are, some, there are some rackets out there, but 
truth is that this is an amazing innovation. Uh, yeah, that it allows people to raise uh, any business to raise raise money from anybody without using any financial intermediaries. I mean, the the amount of innovation and capital that's going to unleash on the planet Earth is is beyond uh, belief. I mean, it's in, in, inconceivable what the ICO market could do to transform the, the, the nature of capital markets themselves over the next ten years. Yeah, Mitch, go ahead, jump in. The, yeah, the, the, issue, the issue with the ICO market, as I see it, it's an exciting market, but it's the wild, wild west in early days. And what's going to happen is the, the, the propaganda bullhorns of the media and advocates for the J.P. Morgans and the Goldmans who are being infringed upon when these uh, offerings come out, and they're not going to get their fees. So what will happen is they'll make an example out of one that fails, like the media yeah. does. They'll have, yeah. you know, blow it up into a... Uh, epic proportion. This is bad. You're going to get ripped off. Don't do this. Give us your money. Only invest through something that we vet for you. So, yeah, there will be winners and losers, and you have to keep the perspective. Like I said at the beginning, there's perspective and risk and reward. And don't, you know, don't go out and mortgage your house and put everything in, into Bitcoin or an ICO. But look, you look at this as, as a portion of your portfolio and have a diversification in your portfolio. And when you, when you go into a high risk thing like an ICO, do your due diligence, do your own homework. And like I say in my book, don't ever invest in anything that you don't fully understand. If you don't fully understand it and you invest in it, then you deserve to lose what you lose. But you know, if you give it your best, don't put all your money into it. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify, put a little bit into it. And if you take a loss on that and you make a profit somewhere else, then you can balance out. But your payout with some of these is going to be exponential, as we, we've witnessed before. The problem comes in when you try to harness the volatility. Okay, Gary, let me give, go back to you, Cambridge, give you the last word here. What does Bitcoin and, and similar uh, currencies, what do they have to do to create confidence in people that are, just see it as too risky? What maybe one or two steps they need to uh, install? Well, I, I think, you know, similar to the to mid to late 90s during the, uh, the dot-com kind of run-up, we're yeah. in the infrastructure building phase uh, for cryptocurrency and crypto assets. I mean, yesterday we had three major exchanges experience significant problems. Uh, two of those exchanges are going to be relied upon by CME for their futures market. Uh, that simply can't happen, uh, you know, on a regular basis like it does for this market to be taken seriously by institutions, to be trusted by uh, a broader class of individuals. So more capital markets infrastructure is needed. Uh, the right balance of regulation is needed. And I think people absolutely need to understand that this is, is you know, still very early stage, very volatile. I agree with the, you know, the comments that have been made about only put into this what you can afford to lose because it is still very high risk. Okay, well, it's, it's been an interesting ride. I'm sure we're going to see a lot more ahead. That's all uh, the, all the time we have, uh, gentlemen. Many thanks to my guests in New York, Atlanta, and in Cambridge. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, cross-talk rules.